Hello, everyone. My name is E. David Crawford from the University of California in San Diego. We are excited to continue our multidisciplinary pet tumor boards. This truly is a multidisciplinary team. We have two medical oncologists on it, and they're internationally renowned, Dr. Dan Petrolak from Yale University, and also Dr. Andrew Hahn, who's a medical oncologist from MD Anderson in Houston. We've got two urologists. I'm one of them. The other one is Wayne Brisbane from UCLA, and we're going to be joined by a nuclear medicine physician, really one of the best in the world, Sharif Gamey, and he is uh, from UCSD in San Diego, and he's going to share with us a lot of knowledge he has about PET scanning. And finally, Dr. Sean Collins, who is a radiation oncologist who recently left uh, the Washington, D.C. area and is now in sunny Florida in the Tampa area, the university there. So let's go ahead and get started um, with our first case. And so this is um, a pet tumor board. And what we have here is a 66-year-old male who presents with an elevated PSA and MRI showing pyrex spore in five. His PSA was nine and uh, got to that level over several years. He did have his prostate sized and it was 85 grams, giving him a high PSA density. 0.11, and he had a CAPR score here. Uh, he had a risk of, uh, of prostate cancer we'll talk about in a minute with the NCCN after we get some more data. So let me ask, uh, start out with our urology colleague here. Wayne, what's the next step with this guy? So I do think it's probably a biopsy. It looks like there's, a, there's slots for biopsy uh, grades to come in at some point, but um, I would offer him a biopsy of both targets. You could plus minus systematics, but I, I do think that his PSA density is a little low with that elevated PSA. Yeah. Sorry, with his with his uh, prostate size, but that's what I would offer. Okay. So that's uh so what happened is he did get biopsy, and I'll show you those in a minute. He had some grade group four in there, three of twelve cores positive. His uh, CAPRA score, as I mentioned, is five. He was NCC and high risk. Charleston score uh, is reasonably healthy and not great, but three. And he did have a family history of uh, prostate cancer. So, Sharif, here's a MRI. And I just want to point out that uh, none of the faculty members have seen these cases except their own before. Um, and Sharif has seen some of the x-rays here. And um, so we have an MRI here. Nothing, nothing exciting, right? Just no. uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. It doesn't look like there's much going on other than the lesion, obviously, in the right posterior mid. It looks like a pyrads four at the left posterior lateral apex as well. Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay, here are our biopsies, and and just what the uh, MRI told us. He had a right lateral base, which was a four three seven. He had a four four eight and right lateral mid and a four three seven and the uh, right medial mid. Okay, so what's the uh, what's the next step here, Sean? What what would you do next with him? So he's basically a middle aged guy. Um, he has high risk prostate cancer. He has an enlarged prostate. I would say he's a candidate for surgery or radiation with hormonal therapy. Okay. Andy, uh, Dan, any other any other things you would want on this guy? Any other scans or anything? I'd want a PSMA PET scan with his least in the 80s. <laughs> I, I agree. Okay. So uh, um, is that what you did then at Anderson, uh, Andy? Yeah, typically so. Yeah, I think when we see these kind of, uh, kind of classic localized uh, high risk without the PSMA PET, yeah, we go ahead and get it. So, so what's a, what's a driving force here? The Gleason eight, the, the PS. But what what's driving it? Just just because uh, the Gleason eight, and it isn't really going to change what you do. Yeah, I think in my mind, uh, it's the Gleason eight, and I think the decision factor there is if you end up finding any degree of nodal involvement, that's going to change a bit of the calculus. Now, both options are still reasonable there, um, as Sean 
pointed out, but that would be the the consideration. Um, also, if we're seeing nodal involvement, it's going to make us reconsider what's um, the role of an AR pathway inhibitor for this patient from a hormone therapy perspective. Okay. Well, we ordered uh, uh, my uh, PET scan, a Postluma scan, and uh, Sharif, you want to comment on it? Yeah, um, I, I could I could show images. I'm just not sure which one of the patients that we're talking about, but generally by the images that you have pulled up, it looks like there's uh, at least one uh, focally tracer avid lesion in the right prosthetic lobe peripheral zone um, that I think this is um, definitely a disease-involved region. There's a second region that looks like it's also involved in the anterior transitional zone. But um, I'm kind of just from the image that you have pulled up, and if you'd like to have give me the, the which medical number we're talking about of the two patients that we're presenting today, I I'd, I'd want to see probably on the MRI back again and look at the at the prosthetic capsule here. The um, PSMA activity seems to be extending all the way out to that area, and it might impact your decision in terms of medical management if that's uh, involved versus not. And I think, I don't know if this is the one that we were also talking about, but there was also a question about seminal vessel infiltration about one of the other. Right. Yeah, okay. So let's uh, let's just go on for a second. We'll come back to this. The, what uh, Some of the discussion points are here that, uh, we're, we're worried about that, that. Do these things really help in planning surgery and radiation? So I, I, I guess the story here is if we go back to this this uh, postluma scan here, and they're they're finding and and this is you know I'm sorry I put this in front of you without giving a medical record number, Sharif, but. This is a, a patient that you read out as uh, uh, represent capsular and right seminal vesicle infiltrations uh, may be present. And to me, that that's a big red flag. And I I, I wonder if, uh, if Sean would comment for a minute or two and then Wayne on how, how this finding would direct uh, changes in your approach, uh, surgery, whatever. So... I can start with the radiation first. So to me, th that scan is very helpful to me because it makes it easy for me to boost the dose to the abnormal spot on the on the post-luma scan. So what we've discovered in radiation oncology is giving a, a higher dose to the prosthetic interdominant lesions, we can actually improve local control. So it'd be helpful for that. The fact that there is no cancer in the lymph nodes on the scan is also helpful because there's recent data from Tata Memorial in India showing that with people who have negative PSMA scans in the pelvic nodes, there actually there's a, a benefit to doing pelvic radiation. So if we chose radiation, we would do hormonal therapy, we would boost the dominant intraprostatic lesion, and we would treat the pelvic lymph nodes. But I'd love to hear Wayne's point of view. Yeah, I think it, it's similar for surgery. You're just kind of trying to decide you can spare his uh, nerves. And if there's concern for extracapsular extension or seminal vesicle invasion, it definitely changes the calculus of the, of the nerve spare. I do think that MRI and the, the PET or post-luma scan are very helpful. Obviously, the PET is very specific. So if, you're, if you have some concern that there's cancer there, it can, it's, it's usually the case. It might under-diagnose um, some things and so I and obviously the spatial resolution is a problem. So I think multi, MRI, you can get a little better spatial resolution at the level of the capsule, but you can also use the PSMA as an overlay of the same spot to be certain that that's the kind of the tumor clone that's the worst. So I do think that they're both helpful. So they're uh, they're actually complementary, and add add something here. Let me ask uh, anybody: Is there a, there is a, a way that we can? determine more at, at maybe pre-radiation or pre-operatively if the seminal vesicles involved or if the capsules involved, any other ideas? I mean, your finger still works pretty well. Uh, I, still, <laughs> I still do a DRE right before surgery. Uh, we're using micro ultrasound and my, uh, using some nomograms with those, but so I think there's multiple ways. I, uh, and I think that, that micro ultrasound is, uh, we've been talking about this now for three or four years, and it's nice to see that it's uh, coming forward. Well, uh, Dan and I remember this. Uh, uh, one of our friends, Neil Stone, made a, a, a lot of noise in the, in the past about biopsying the seminal vesicles and doing a biopsy here. 
Is there anything wrong? I, I, I saw this guy and thought maybe this is something to think about doing. Anybody think that would be um, be helpful? If, if that's positive, I mean, it, it, it does mean something. If it's negative, you might have missed it. But it, does that uh, it, it incite anybody with any interest in doing that before we proceed? It wouldn't affect the radiation fields because we always treat the, uh, the prophylactically treat the seminal vesicles if they're involved or not. So we would, in this case, we would also treat the pelvic lymph nodes so it wouldn't impact our radiation field. So Andy, uh, as you know, medical oncologists are kind of in the middle on a lot of these things, it's supposed to be balanced between surgery and radiation. <laughs> um, what, what, what are your thoughts here? But uh, Dave, I'm gonna push you a bit more on that. Is that the question of choice of surgery or radiation from the med -onc perspective, or is that choice of hormone therapy? Well, I think it's both. I mean, I see that, that I, I would say that if, if Sean saw this guy, a radiation oncologist, they're gonna definitely add hormone therapy to this, at least in a, I, I don't know if that's gonna happen with surgery. You wouldn't normally do that, would you, Wayne? Yeah, no, if this is surgery, there's no role for hormonal therapy. And I think we have to remember, I mean, this is where these cases get really complicated is we're using modern imaging and applying it to our prior um, risk scores and our prior decision-making. So, you know, this guy's very cleanly localized high-risk disease, but then from a from a med onc perspective, now I see Gleason 8 and I see seminal vesicle invasion, and I'm going to say, ooh, should I, you know, apply that back to Stampede and to think about adding abiraterone into this as well? He's a young guy, so ADT plus Abby 18 to 24 months is something I would think about for this guy if we're going to do primary radiation. You can argue it because we're applying contemporary imaging to older data. From the surgery versus radiation perspective, I guess my bias here is he's young. If this, if we didn't have this PET scan, he probably would have been going down the, the surgery route for many. Um, so I would give him the benefit of the doubt likely there and where we can clean up with radiation thereafter. But either is very reasonable approach. Yeah, I, I think you have to also look at the general internal medicine, overall patient welfare, patient well-being situation. If you're putting this patient on radiation therapy, you're giving them hormones. You're committing them to 18 months of hormone therapy plus abiraterone or another agent. You know, it's the old TV commercial, you could pay me now or pay me later. And, you know, some patients are willing to take that risk of, of having postoperative radiation with plus hormones, really having, you know, the trifecta with the possibility that they may not be, that may be spared of hormone therapy later on. So I think that's an important consideration in a young patient. Great. Well, you know, it's been a terrific discussion. Thank you all. We will keep you. Let, we'll let you know what happens to this guy. Um, we're, we actually got a visit with him scheduled in a couple of weeks. Thank you all.